one notice I did forget is that um, this was found out in the car park. So if it belongs to you, just let me know later. It's a little diary. I haven't had a look inside. Well, I looked inside the cover to see your name, but I won't go looking through it because diaries are personal things for people. So uh, I don't know if it's got personal things in there or not. We've been looking through the life of Joseph and we've seen that even though this teenager was probably spoiled and naive, God had still given him spiritual gifts. He still had, um, um, he had those dreams and they were from God. I enjoyed going over the sins of the brothers because the sins of the brothers are so, um, just a picture of what sin can do in us. And the brothers, it really hit me that the brothers had planned to kill him. And then, of course, they end up, well, they just threw him into the a pit instead. And then they go and eat. And I know I'm just going over some of the things, but how could they sit down and eat after they've just decided to, to kill their brother? And, well, the simple reason is to kill someone is, seems in our minds a big sin, but just to throw them in a bit into, a, I was say a bin, into a pit is a smaller sin. And if we start thinking about our biggest sins, we won't worry so much about the smaller sins. If a man says, I'm about to go out and commit adultery, he won't think much about just looking at pornography. When the reality is that looking at pornography is bad. When the reality is, it was still bad to throw his, their brother into the pit with a view perhaps killing him or selling him off or whatever. But they could eat freely because they thought, well, we haven't killed him, it's... Do you know what I mean? That's the deceitfulness of sin. And we can see that through the story of Joseph. And there are so many other stories that come through as well for this man that would one day be governor over all Egypt and would also have in his mindset this tremendous view of the, the providence of God, the sovereignty of God, and he would say these words uh, at the end of the book of Genesis. It is ref- referring to his brothers that said, look, don't kill us, etc., etc. He said, fear not. For am I in the place of God? But as for you, ye thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good to bring to pass, as it is this day, to save much people alive. And he could see that God's hand was in all those terrible things that happened to him. Now let's just pause for a minute. Do we see God's hand in the things that happen to us? And I know there's people here that have suffered tremendously do we see God's hand and understand that he's a good and a gracious God. Let's open our Bibles up to the book of Genesis, Genesis chapter 39. And I'm glad you're all here and I'm glad we can come around the word of God. It's a, it's a wonderful word. Genesis 39, I'm reading from verse 1. <clears throat> And perhaps if you're able, we'll stand for the reading of God's word. Genesis 39, reading from verse 1. And Joseph was brought down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard, an Egyptian, bought him of the hands of the Ishmaelites, which had brought him down thither. And the Lord was with Joseph, and he was a prosperous man. And he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian, And his master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord made all that he did to prosper in his hand. And Joseph found grace in his sight and he served him and he made him overseer over his house and all that he had put into his hand. And it came to pass from the time that he had made him overseer in his house and over all that he had that the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. And the blessing of the Lord was upon all that he had in the house and in the field. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you we can gather around your word. We thank you we can come as a church family. We ask your blessings upon this church. Lord, may, may we grow, may we fulfil the commission that you've given us. Lord, we pray for those with particular needs amongst us and each of us, our minds rush to various people with particular needs. Uh, perhaps not mentioned this morning, we remember Ursula with a bad back. Lord, we would also think of the various missionaries that we support and we do pray especially for the boys back in the the thick of things in at Alata. We ask your blessings upon them to encourage them, to um, enable them. Lord, as we also gather here this morning, we know that 
the word of God is like a mirror that we can see ourselves in it. May we do so this morning. We come humbly, Lord, to meet in your presence and to hear from you. Amen. Please be seated. (coughs) What abrupt changes for little Joseph. One minute he's a favoured son. He's wearing this lovely coloured coat and he's he's the spoiled little son. And then he's grabbed and he's taken off into slavery and he goes down to Egypt. And then we read these words. Folks, Joseph never asked for these changes. God was already working on his life and these changes came into his life abruptly. He never asked for them. He was happy at home with his father, you know, talking of his dreams. He's gone from the silver spoon to a slave. He was a favoured son. He was a spoilt son. And now he's gone to become a, a slave. And perhaps very few of us understand that that tremendous shock of, of change and, and uh, the things that happen so rapidly, it's enough to unsettle us. And um, we find him here in these verses starting a new life. He's starting it separate. His, his dad's not there. There's no friends with him. There's no one else there to be with him. And this is God's school. This was God's school. I know it was, I had an abrupt change in my life when I, I left home at 17 and I, I joined the police force, went down to the, uh, the academy and you, know, you wake up at a certain time with bells ringing and all this old marching music and, and all of these things came in your life and it was, a, it was an abrupt change for me. Um, for, for other people, sudden illness can change their life. They find out that they're not able to do the things that once were or perhaps... Um, there might be a death in the family. We know that perhaps sometimes when the, the father dies, the oldest son has to go out to work to support the family. There's a big change. Big changes can happen in people's lives. Perhaps if, they, if the baby arrives in, in the house, there's a, there's a dramatic change. And it's even lo- more long-term if that baby has special needs. Um, lives change completely with a marriage breakdown or, or getting the sack from work. They're, they're all things that we, we have around us. The people at Geelong with the Ford um, closing in, in a couple of years' time, they're having to reschedule all their thinking about their jobs and there's a few thousand workers there that are having to think, well, what are they going to do? What's going to happen with them? Um, most people have these sudden changes in their lives but rarely do they see God's hand working on them. God's hand was on Joseph, and and I believe that he would later look and see it. He would recognise it. We read in verse 1 that Joseph is sold to a man of calibre. Let's look at verse 1 again. And Joseph was brought down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard, an Egyptian, bought him of the hands of the Ishmaelites, which had brought him down thither. So Potiphar is an officer of Pharaoh. He's a captain of the garden. The word captain there also has the idea of a governor. He's, he's a, a ruler. So he's a man of class. He's a man of prestige. He's a man of wealth that had qualities of leadership. He had the qualities that were required of a governor, of someone in close contact with the pharaoh. He was able to deal in the top echelons of of power and authority. He was someone that Joseph could learn from. God knew that Joseph would need to learn to become a future governor of Egypt. Who should he then serve under? Even though Joseph had no idea and and obviously Potiphar had no idea. This was God's hand working again in Joseph's life. And and he's learning, he's starting at the very bottom of Potiphar's household. Does God spend that much time on us? It's been said that God loves everyone every man as though there was no one else. Folks, if if that's true, I believe it is true, he's also preparing you. Now, we're not all destined to be a Charles Spurgeon or a Joseph in charge of Egypt, but God is preparing each one of us. He's bringing things out in our life. 
We're not to think in terms of worldly great, greatness, but rather stop and consider what does it mean in the spiritual realm? What influence do we have spiritually and with your family, with those that we interact with? Um, we all have spiritual gifts. Everyone here has spiritual gifts and we need to stop and say, well, how can I use them? Joseph, without knowing it, would look at Potiphar and say, I'm going to learn from that man. I'm going to obey him. This is my God-given role. I'm here as a, a slave. I'm going to obey him and learn. And Potiphar would be his model. And no doubt Joseph would use this to the best of his ability. By the time we've reached verse 2, we see Joseph leaving the slave quarters. He's now living in the master's house. Have a look in verse 2. And the Lord was with Joseph, and he was a prosperous man, and he was in the house of his master the Egyptian. So Joseph begins at the bottom, but then he's elevated to live in the master's house above the other slaves. And verse 3 is something that's very fascinating. You might say, Pastor, you're reading too much into it. Let's have a look at it and work it out for ourselves. And his master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord made all that he did to prosper and he made all that he did to prosper in him. His hand. So this shrewd man, I'm suggesting the governor, man with oversight, he absorbed that the Lord was with Joseph and it was the Lord that made him to prosper. Now Potiphar was a man with his own little gods. He would have had his own god of this, the Ra and Osiris and all these other gods. (coughs) But there's two Hebrew words that are normally used when referring to to Lord, and, and here we see the word Yahweh. We see uh, in our Bibles the word Lord is capitalised, meaning it's Yahweh, when it, when it could be also referred to Adonai, which is then usually in the lower case. Why would Moses have this recorded? Was this just an oversight or was this something particular? Why would Moses write, and the master saw that Yahweh was with him, And that Yahweh made all that he did to prosper in his hand. Because Yahweh is the name for God's special revelation of his name to his people. In Egypt, they knew nothing of Yahweh. How could the master see in verse 3 that Yahweh was with Joseph? Or was Moses just taking liberty and giving writing down for us really what, uh, what the truth was? I believe that perhaps the simple answer is that Joseph told him. Potiphar's probably interviewed Joseph at various times and asked about his background and who he was and what he believed. Or perhaps as time went by, he observed him and said, talk to me about yourself. You know, who are you? What, what have you done? And perhaps as he noticed how this man is excelling and, and it appears that there's blessing upon him and the God or gods, whoever he believed was upon him, he's asked him more questions and he sort of said, well, tell me more about yourself. And at some point, Joseph has talked about his God. Joseph has talked about his God. Now that could have put Potiphar right off, but it didn't because Potiphar has recognised something unusual in Joseph that commanded his attention. He's looking at Joseph and thinking, why is he different? Is it because of this Yahweh? Look, he may not have liked what he heard, but he was thinking, I'm interested in this. I'm interested that there is a difference here. There's something happening here. Now we know that Abraham had been to Egypt many years earlier, but it's highly unlikely that Potiphar has known anyone that knew the one true God, Yahweh, the God of the Hebrews. And this would mean, of course, that Joseph would be watched by Potiphar to see what sort of a man he was that talked about this one true God. We might say it's like, what sort of a work testimony did Joseph has? And isn't there a lesson for us What is our testimony like towards God? I can say it with a lot of sadness, but I know there are some Christians, and I don't know of any here, but they've got a reputation of being slipshod and careless and 
and uh, lazy in their work, they think, well, you know, close enough is, is good enough. And other people look at them and they think, well, I don't know that they'd want to employ them. In fact, some people prefer not to hire other Christians because it's like they always want preferential treatment. You know, look, I'm a brother in the Lord. Surely you can do something cheaper than that for me. You know, or you, you, we expect more because we sort of use the system back to front and it's just a, the tainting of sin. Uh, we see that in the world around us, honestly. But what should happen is that people see someone working and they see their work ethic and say, well, they're ho- honest, they're wholesome, they're hardworking. And then, say, and then they find out that they're a Christian. And then they think to themselves, how good must God be that they are so different? Perhaps people will find out that you're easy to get along with, that you're likeable, maybe even lovable, maybe you're sweet, but you're still also hard-working and conscientious. And if your employer hears, that's a Christian, he might say, well, I wish I could employ ten more like that. Sad, isn't it? That's not always the case, that uh, Christians expect special favours and, and treatment. Verse 3 tells us that Potiphar saw that the God who revealed himself to the Jewish people through his special name was with Joseph and was causing him to prosper. Potiphar would have known that it was not easy for this young man because this man would look at his hands and and they're not tough hands. They weren't rough and and they'd look into his face. It wasn't weather beaten or it might have gotten a bit by the time he got down there but he wasn't he hadn't been a hard-working man. He would have been. Uh, he could see that he's a man that's had it easy. Potiphar would look at him and he'd say, "There's some, been some big changes here. He's he's developing. He's he's learning and he's growing, and uh, he's working from the bottom up. He, he's why is he prosperous? He puts it down." To God, But there's some other thoughts I want you to consider. He's prosperous. Why is he prosperous? And there's another reason it should be common for each of us as Christians as well. Joseph excelled here partly because this new life meant comparatively little to him. He's detached from what he's doing. Firstly, he's attached to the Lord. Secondly, his heart and his ambition were elsewhere. People that are sometimes so attached to their surroundings, they're hanging on to them, aren't as effective as they could be. You see, Egypt really never meant anything to Joseph. There are people that can get so emotionally or personally involved that their struggles to get on to improve are counterproductive. You know, it's like they're trying too hard to be something. They're trying too hard to do something. They're trying too hard to prove something. Joseph wasn't doing any of those. He didn't choose to be there. He didn't wish to be there. He was just doing his best. His heart really wasn't there. Christians need to learn the sense that we're servants and that we're pilgrims. I can think of men that have gone to Bible college that, that have never wanted to go out into ministry. They, did, they wanted to stay put in their own home and perhaps work from their home and work from what they've amassed already. And it's like it had a hold on them. It's like they could never grow past that. They were never willing to step out and trust God and, and, uh, and see what God would do because that they're emotionally or personally, they're somehow they're attached and they're held. And, and there's others that they are in a nice place but they've had to shift and they see themselves as servants and pilgrims and, and you know, they would settle in anywhere. They'd be happy wherever the Lord put them if that was what the Lord wanted. They've got the idea, we're just servants. The world doesn't have a hold on us because we belong to God. And I believe there's some of that aspect here in Joseph. He's highly successful because he's not in the rat race trying to succeed. He's being prosperous before God. He's not held to it. I'm sure there are other slaves around Joseph that would have loved to have stepped up and lived in the master's house rather than the, the dirty little shambles at the back. But it didn't mean that much to Joseph though. Partly because he's in a strange country and also because he's not taking himself that seriously. 
He just got on with the job before God. There was nobody else that knew him. There was nobody else to impress. He was <coughs> just there before God doing his best. The days when his brothers were there are far distant. If he'd have had family there, he'd say, wow, isn't Joseph getting by? Isn't Joseph moving up the ranks? And he could say, well, yes, you know, I started off here and now I'm here. He didn't have any of that. And folks, this is the peer pressure that you and I have, that we have, that can, that can hold us down sometimes from being more successful, from being more prosperous in the idea, on the eyes of the Lord. There's little delight for him if nobody knows him and why does it matter what these other strangers think of him? Perhaps as a... What, perhaps I could ask, what would have been his ambition? And perhaps as a... As a normal person that's grown up more than anything else, he would have wanted vindication before his brothers. He would have wanted to be able to shout out to the Lord, this wasn't right what my brothers did to me. Your brothers, this was wrong. This shouldn't have happened. He wanted to be proved to be right. And you know what? It's an unreachable goal. He's taken off into slavery. There's, there's no one there that can help him. This is a goal that he would never in his own timing be able to do. He wanted to be proved right. And you know, sometimes, folks, God leaves us with these unreachable goals so that we have to just stop and trust in God. We have to be able to say, Lord God, I can't quite reach this. I can't make it. I've just got to trust in you. He does that. It breaks our heart because we'd like to think that, oh yes, I can achieve this and achieve this and achieve this. But it's not always to our advantage. And when it does, we think it goes to our heads and it changes our lives. And there's a sense where perhaps Joseph said, oh, I wish I could have gone back. Well, he couldn't. Folks, do you ever think to yourself, oh, the good old days. You know, when churches were doing this or the good old days when I was earning big money or the good old this or whatever it is and you're not content with where you are or you don't see that God has allowed us in a particular place. We can never go back to the way things were and that's something we all struggle with within our Christian life. We can go on for the Lord but we can never go back. Joseph is now in phase two of his preparation. Phase one had been thrown into the pit and being rescued in time to be kept alive. uh, We've already looked at that. We could say that phase two now is almost the fun part. When God makes us break from the past, he puts something else in its place to make things not only bearable but pleasant. You see, the same thing happened with Moses. Moses went out... And he was going to break from Pharaoh's court and he was going to identify with his own people, the Jewish people. And they rejected him big time. He had to learn, well he was cast out and of course he went wandering in the desert. But was that a bad time those next 40 years? No. He met his wife. He had his children. He was out there on the desert and he was out there in the country. He was learning things he hadn't learned. He had peace. He had happiness. God was making things very bearable for him. He had a change of life. It was refreshment. God did that for Moses. God doesn't want us to be unhappy either. He wants us to get our joy from him and also from the joy that his provisions, uh, that he gives us. God does this to encourage us to go on. I'm going to suggest there are three ways that God made things bearable for Joseph, not in any particular order. Firstly, Joseph had rest from his enemies. He'd had a rough time with his brothers. Do you think this was the first time that his brothers had been angry with him or done something violent towards him? Probably not. If they were about to kill him on this occasion, what had they done a week before or a month before or six months before? What had they been doing previous to that? This was a time of rest for Joseph. This was a time of recuperation. Now we know that he brought a lot upon himself, but he was really the victim of some very cruel hatred. And there comes a time when God said, enough is enough on my child. I will take them out of that. I'll give them a change. I'll give them a rest. God knows how much we can bear. And there comes a time when God looks down from heaven 
and lets us know he sees what we're going through. He sees what you're going through. It may be persecution. It may be someone constantly annoying you. It it could be a threat. It could be a severe kind of pressure and rich, uh, unless if it if it doesn't stop, it'll, it'll break you up and we go through that. We know various pressures. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 10, There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape, that ye may be able to bear it. So God tells us through the Apostle Paul, that we all go through the same sort of trials and he understands us. And, and though we might think ours is unique, there's others that have gone through that as well. And God will enable you to bear it and go through that trial. Joseph was given rest from his brothers who hated and wanted to kill him. He was able now to live free from this sort of terror that you know the brothers were going to sneak in and shortchange his bed or something worse. You know, the, the things that he could live with. He, he was free from that sort of terror. He wasn't overjoyed by being in Egypt, but at least he didn't have this hanging over his head. There's a second thing that made this bearable, and really this is the main thing. Joseph had the presence of the Lord in verse 2. Now, this had always been true before. We see that Joseph had had dreams that he'd had the presence of the Lord. But I would think that whenever something went wrong, whenever he felt bad, he'd come running up to his little his daddy that had given him that coat of many colours and, and his daddy would have probably patted him on the head or the shoulders and encouraged him and there would have been others that would have encouraged him as well. But now he needed God. Now he needed God. Now he needed the presence of God. Now he needed God. And this was something that God, in those times of great trial, he is near us. Oh, it's easy to go through life and everything's running smooth and we can, we can think, well, I'd love to have the presence of God, I'd love to have the blessings of this. But when you go into great trials, often God is there and you know it. And if you don't know it, you know those promises so strongly that you know that he is. God doesn't leave us in times of trial. Times of blessings, in fact, the the, um, Psalms, Proverbs, Psalmist, Proverbs tells us it's better to go into a, a house of mourning than it is to go to a feast because it stops and makes us think about life and thinks about God. It's better sometimes to go to a funeral. It's better than to go to a party because we stop and consider life. I wonder how many of us have been like Joseph where we've been brought to the place where we really need God. We might have support from others, but God has allowed us to come close to him. Sometimes it's almost like God has pulled the rug out from underneath us, that that God has done that. And then we stop and we think that God has allowed that or God has done that, that we might know him. And it's a blessing. It's something that our mind can't grapple with. Often as long as there's a a father or a mother or brothers or sisters or good mates or a good job or a house or whatever else you put your trust in, we don't turn to God. And it takes some trial or something else that wakes us up to the one that is eternal, that is everything. When God seeks for a man or a woman for a mission high on God's agenda will simply be this. God alone must be precious. God alone must be a treasure. God alone must be so very valuable to us. And that's why he breaks us from our past. That's why he cuts off family sometimes so that for the first time we will know what God is really like. And we're saying, God, why? But it's because God loves us. Because God wants to draw us to himself. Now, there's a third thing I'm going to mention that made things bearable for Joseph, even pleasant for Joseph. He prospered in his new career. And there's only one explanation for that, and it's given in verse 2. God did it for him. God did it to encourage him. 
Folks, there's coming a time soon where Joseph is going to be thrown back into the dungeon. But God knows what we're able to bear and God was going to encourage him. He's given him this time of refreshment, this time of prospering, this time of learning, this time of experiencing uh, Potiphar's court because God knows what is coming ahead but he wants also to encourage. And, And folks, God loves us. He desires to encourage us. And when we are blessed, let us be encouraged. Joseph treasured his dreams from God, but they're all put on the shelf now. He's learning new gifts. He's learning how to react with people differently. He's learning a different form of authority lines. He's he's learning. This was the man of God that God was training to be the governor over Egypt and ultimately to be the saviour of his brothers and his family. These five verses that we've looked at are not just padding. It's showing us God at work where Joseph was being trained and the importance of the Lord being with us. The Lord being with you. I'm going to finish in a simple sentence. May we view our trials as a training ground and seek to draw near to God. May we view our trials as a training ground and seek to draw near to God. Let's pray. King of kings, Lord of lords, true God, we would humble ourselves before you for each of us stop and look at our lives and we think of the ups, the downs, we think of the times and though we're not being shaped for Governor of Egypt, you would train us, that you would work in our lives, that we might be governors in our own spiritual sphere, in our own realm. And we're so very thankful, Lord, that for that, that it's something that we can do, that we can serve you in whatever way that you've called us. It may be in being a parent, it may be with a ministry of encouragement, it may be a of serving, whatever it may be, and that we can find great fulfilment in this. Lord, we thank you that above all these things you are our Saviour and our Lord and we can rest in that. We can know the freedom of being a child, of being saved. I thank you for these people here this morning. I ask your blessings upon them in the name of our gracious Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.